are coming on the air with a deadly snowstorm shutting down pretty much the whole Northeast. Thousands of people stranded in cars or airports. Even more don't have power. The whole thing making a mess of the school day. We're live with what's happening now and what's next. That snow not stopping voters on Long Island, making their pick to replace controversial former Congressman George Santos. But this is bigger than just one seat in the House. Why, what happens tonight could help us read the tea leaves for November. And speaking of November and the election year, tonight you've got Nikki Haley accusing Donald Trump of trying to take the election by suggesting his own daughter-in-law should help run the GOP. We're live on the trail with that and a closer look at what's motivating her voters. Plus, the new court documents our team is just now getting in Texas, showing the woman who opened fire at a Houston megachurch has intentionally hurt her child in the past, her seven-year-old son now fighting for his life. Plus, a new interview with his grandmother about the warning signs she saw. And huge layoffs tonight at Paramount, not even 24 hours after record viewership at the Super Bowl. Why this could point to maybe an exit strategy for the company a little bit later on in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and tonight it's the kind of storm the Northeast hasn't seen in years, now turning deadly, killing one person with roads, flights, power grids all snarled up. People are starting to dig out. Look at this, after snow blanketed all these big cities. In Pennsylvania alone, nearly 100,000 people are without power. And whiteout conditions have made driving kind of a nightmare. PA State Police say they responded to more than 1,200 crashes or stuck cars today alone. And in one town in that state, a person died when he collided with a downed power line while on a snowmobile. In the air, some 1,200 flights are canceled, 2,000 delayed because of ground stops. And in New York City, plows hit the streets for the first time in two years. It's been this long. It's been two years since the city's seen that much snow with Central Park looking like a winter wonderland. And while kids from several school districts across Boston, Connecticut, New Jersey got snow days, those at New York public schools had remote learning, although early morning technical issues delayed the starting bell. Meteorologist Bill Karens is standing by with where this storm is headed next, but I want to get to Aaron McLaughlin out first in snowy Central Park. It's been a couple of years since New Yorkers have seen a scene like the one you're standing in, Aaron. Yeah, that's right, Hallie. As you said, this is the most New York snow New York City has seen in some two years, uh, deploying those snow plows for the very first time. Still, I was just on the phone with a state official who told me that this was not as bad as what they had expected, as what was originally in the forecast. It was originally forecast that New York City would see some six to eight inches of snow, and it saw some three to four inches. So state officials breathing a sigh of relief. They're telling you they've seen no major impacts, at least for New York State. I'll tell you who's not breathing a sigh of relief, though, is local businesses. I was speaking to a florist here on the Upper West Side. Remember, tomorrow is their Super Bowl. It's Valentine's Day. Their business really relies on people walking into that flower shop, buying flowers to give to their loved ones. And she was worried that this snow, though short and sharp, lasting only a matter of hours, could impact that bottom line. Take a listen to what she had to say. We didn't know it was coming, so I just did everything normally and when we found out that the storm was coming i i actually uh gave one driver the day off just and just used one to just run everything just to minimize risk and while new york state may have emerged from this storm comparatively unscathed that is of course not the situation for other states in the Northeast. You mentioned Pennsylvania, 136,000 households there without power. 1,200 cars either collided or stuck in the snow, and at least one fatality in that state alone. And then in Connecticut, snow got up to 15 inches. Holly. Aaron, we talked about how school districts in some cities were shut down. Kids had a snow day, but in other spots, like in New York, it was remote learning. New York Public Schools said this was a test for that kind of thing. They had a lot of complications this morning. Do, do, from what we're hearing from parents, does it feel like the district failed that test? Well, I think failed is a strong word. I don't think they deserved an F in this case, but it did not go well, Hallie. We heard from the mayor in advance of the storm say that he did not want kids out here in places like Central Park making snowmen. He wanted them in classrooms in some way, shape, or form, being at remote learning and learning. Although when everyone went to log on this morning, we're talking about over a million kids across some 1,600 schools. Hundreds of thousands of them were not able to log on. A public officials saying that that was due to a glitch with the software. That
that was soon fixed, although a lot of city officials here expressing that dissatisfaction. They knew that this was going to be a possibility. They thought they had prepared, and then they saw those glitches, and it's learning loss here in the city, especially in light of all of the learning loss experienced during the pandemic is a huge concern. So this did not go well uh, from that standpoint, Hallie. Aaron McLaughlin live for us there in New York. Thank you. Meteorologist Bill Karens is joining us now. And Bill, 24 hours ago, you and I talked about how this storm could be a boom, could be a bust. <laughs> Turned out it was pretty much right on track, right? Yeah, boom in some areas, bust in others. Uh, let's talk with the booms first. These are the highest amounts in uh, each state. So Connecticut, West Hartford, 15 inches of snow. You looked like you were going to get a foot. And then we were like, nah, storm going south. You're only, you're only going to get three to six inches. And then like a mega band sat right over Hartford. Uh, <laughs> pretty incredible. Uh, Pennsylvania, they had the most power outages. At one point, 140,000 people in eastern PA were, were without power. Northern New Jersey got nailed. Southern New York and spots in uh, Rhode Island. We're still getting those in, but right around 8 to about 12 inches but the big i-95 cities uh no this was just too warm in many situations dc is soft lakes boston we only got 0.1 you got robbed uh philadelphia barely any at all new york city central park 3.2 but if you weren't in any of the parks in new york city it didn't look like you got any snow at all it was just white rain melting on the roads and the pavement so as far as the winds go they're gonna be kicking down this, this evening we're still pretty gusty gust to 40 out on cape cod and even boston's pretty light now so this storm is gone now everyone always wants to know what's next after this one well we got a couple little storms this first one's going to be tomorrow in areas of the Midwest. This one is just going to race through the Great Lakes. It doesn't have a lot of moisture. It's not a big deal, but it will bring some snow to New England as we go throughout Thursday evening. It'll be added here by Friday. So how much snow with this one? The Dakotas will get southern, uh, South Dakota will get some good snow. Same with southern Minnesota. And then just a coating of snow. Anywhere with white, it's like a slushy inch to an inch of snow. That includes Chicago, Detroit, Buffalo. And it looks like New York City southwards. No snow from this one, but central and northern New England will get a couple inches Thursday night into Friday. I think if anything, Hallie, all that really unusually warm weather we had, that's going to go away for about the next week or two at least. It's actually going to feel like February yeah. for once. Okay, well, f we'll see. Uh, Bill Karens, thank you very much. <laughs> Lots to cover, I know. Appreciate it. Let's take you to this roller coaster ride on Wall Street tonight, going from a record high to its worst day in nearly a year tonight. You see the Dow, the S&P, the NASDAQ all in the red. Why? Because of these new numbers out showing us inflation may be more stubborn than we thought. It's going down a little bit, but it's not going down quickly enough in the eyes of some. At 3.1%, less than what it was in December, but still not where the expectation was, where people had hoped it would be. If you take a look here, essentials are still right around the same price they were last year, like for eggs and bread. Gas and milk are down, but just a few cents. Christine Romans is joining us now. Help us make sense of it. We say sure. a lot the market is not the economy, but just yesterday we were talking about the Dow hitting a record high. Just <laughs> Friday, the S&P was at a record high. Now it's the opposite kind of situation. We have whiplash. Yeah, well, it's because, look, there's this hot, as they say, CPI reading, inflation reading. Everybody wanted to see headline inflation with a 2 in front of it, 2.9% mm -hmm. maybe. You got 3.1. That's better than December. So that is progress on the inflation front. But it's not as as good as people wanted to see. And inside these numbers, some stubborn price gains. Look at what it costs to eat in and eat out. Uh, what I've been hearing from a bunch of the fast food companies is they're noticing that people uh, are buying groceries instead of eating out a lot because the eating out prices are rising still kind of quickly. And also in these numbers, Hallie, uh, shelter, that's housing, that's rent, right? Up 6%. That was, again, hotter than a lot of folks had expected. And that's about two thirds of the headline CPI number was just because of that, those, those, those costly prices for yeah. actually living. And just having a, a roof over your head, right. driving so much of that. You mentioned, Christine, that there are those who wanted to see a two point something in that inflation number. I, I assume that that means the people in charge of the Fed, right? They want to see inflation go down. That's not the case. I mean, it, it's going down a little bit. Yeah. They want to see it going down more quickly. So what does this mean for them and the potential for rate hikes? Where do we stand on that? So the Fed's target inflation rate is 2%, and it uses a different gauge, but similar to the CPI. And look, you're still pretty far from there. And, yeah. you know, when you look at the big spike in, in inflation, right, and then it came off, it's been stubborn here. Now, this is what the Federal Reserve has done to to try to combat these high uh, high prices, right? They've been raised interest rates and then they paused. And the expectation was the next move is going to be a cut because inflation's under control and maybe they have to goose the economy a little bit if it slows. Well, what do we know about the economy? 
it's pretty good. And inflation is still a little too high. So mm. that kind of suggests that the Fed does not really quickly here need to lower interest rates anytime soon. So a lot of people are pushing back their expectations for when those borrowing costs come down. And they matter to everybody. Your credit card interest rate, that's if you right. get a new car loan, if you're refinancing a mortgage, if you're trying to buy a house, if you're a company that's looking to expand and issuing debt, all it ma I mean, those, those, those high interest rates really matter. Christine Romans, thank you so much for breaking that one down. <laughs> I know lots to watch in the days and weeks to come. Yeah. Appreciate it. We're also watching what's going down in New York's third congressional district, where voters, as we speak, are deciding who they want to replace indicted former Congressman George Santos. Only a few more hours left to vote here with a close race between Democrat Tom Suozzi on the left, who used to represent the district on the right, Republican Mazi Pillow. Police, you know, I want some safe streets. And the crime has really been up on the island lately. I would say illegal immigration, economy, uh, foreign policy. Now, if Swazi wins, it would cut into the razor-thin majority Republicans hold in the House, right? Because remember, we're talking about seat by seat here. It is just tight. And the whole thing today is seen as kind of a message test, if you will, for the November election. What works? What doesn't? Will Republicans be able to bring home a win campaigning on immigration? Can Democrats leverage other issues like abortion, guns, democracy? Then, of course, there's the weather wild card. Will today's storm keep anybody away? I want to bring in Yasmin Vesugian. And Yasmin, obviously, this is going to be driven by the issues for voters in what is seen as a test, not just for this particular congressional district today, on this particular day, no. but really as a kind of litmus test more broadly for the next eight months here. It, it is, Hallie. Let me answer your last question first, which was, is the storm going to keep folks away? Um, How'd you like that hood that I had on earlier and some of those thoughts that you, you played? It, girl. Um, 780, <laughs> 785 is the number um, as of 5 p.m. Um, today, um, the folks that have um, voted so far. So it's not keeping people um, away. Top of mind, some of the issues that folks are voting on today, we're talking about immigration mm -hmm. um, and abortion, the number one and two issues that we've been hearing from a lot of voters. And they've been speaking to us, a lot of people pretty vocal about why they're showing up and why this is such an incredibly important race. You talk about kind of this litmus test, Holly, and, and it's a really good point because you talk about this the majority um, in the House, of course, for Republicans. This is an incredibly important seat. But then many of them are voting on a referendum, in a way, on the general election. If, in fact, the former president, Donald Trump, um, uh, becomes the Republican candidate for president, um, going up against um, President Joe Biden. And, and the votes that they are issuing and leveling today are very much a litmus test and a referendum on the votes that they'll issue um, come November. Let's take a listen to some of the voters that we've been I'm hearing from so far outside this middle school. Our border is gone. The culture is changing. There's crime in the streets. There's too high taxes. There's inflation. Can I go on? Do I have a half hour to talk about this? The border. The 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 problem with the abortions and you know what's going on. What's interesting, Hallie, is I think the commonality in many of these voters, whether they're voting Republican um, or Democrat for this seat, is frustration, mm -hmm. right? Frustration with um, the politicization of what's happening in Washington, frustration with lies, um, frustration with stories that are being told, frustration with things not getting done as folks are looking at issues um, with the border. And so yeah. I think that's kind of what's bringing both Republicans and Democrats together today uh, when they're um, voting. However, we've been here all day, a lot of folks enthusiastic about the seat, also because of the controversy surrounding um, George Santos and how this all went down initially. Well, so I was going to ask about that. When you say, Yasmin, that one of the things that you've heard from people is frustration with lies, for example. Should we read that as subtext for frustration with George Santos having come to represent the district in the first place, even yeah. though it was, of course, later discovered that his resume was just uh, fabricated in, in some spots? How much of this is, in the eyes of the folks you're talking to, correcting a wrong? A lot of it. A lot of it. And, and I heard that a lot from folks. They feel like mm. they really didn't have a choice other than George Santos. And many of them didn't even really know much about him. And why wasn't he vetted before taking on um, that position? They're frustrated by that. They feel like they've been misrepresented in Washington for quite some time when they want to right that wrong. And then they want to right the wrong on the national level um, as well. when they're looking ahead to November, hearing some of that from voters as well. Let's listen.
It's sort of placing a person that I didn't agree with in the past, so I felt it was my obligation to come out and cast my vote and hopefully make some changes. It's been so crazy and so polarizing that I just wanted to be back to norm relatively normal. If we don't uh, put the right people in office, uh, if we continue down this same path, the country is doomed. We have to elect people that are for America, not for power. And what's interesting, you know, Hallie, you and I talk about this a lot, and we talk about this going into um, election years all the time, which is women are very much deciding votes um, in some of these things. And I heard a lot of just kind of exhaustion from women, right? Enough is enough. Let's get back to normal. Let's get back to decorum. And I heard that from woman after woman that I spoke to um, outside of this polling site. Yasmin Vasugan, we're glad to have you there. We're glad to have you on the show with so much to watch tonight and so much Thanks to read out. into, I think, in the days to come. Appreciate you, asked. Talk to you. In the next couple of hours, House Republicans are going to try for a do-over, voting again to attempt to impeach the Homeland Security Secretary. House Republicans are feeling pretty good about their odds this time, since one of their members who was being treated for cancer during last week's failed vote is now back in D.C. But even with the slimmest of majorities, right, they've got the slim majority. So it means that an illness, a delayed flight, any Republican absence could put this vote in jeopardy for them. And here's the thing. Let's say it does pass. It's basically DOA in the Senate anyway. You've got Senate Democrats and a bunch of Republicans, too, telling the House they should instead take some action on what the Senate just passed overnight, this $95 billion aid package. Remember, this is this sort of monster bill that was supposed to address issues on the border. It has no border funding in it now, but there's some other stuff in it, aid to Israel, aid to Ukraine, et cetera. While the border aid went away in that package, the issues at the border have not, with some sections seeing some significant upticks in migrant encounters in just the last few weeks. I want to bring in our team covering this. David Noriega on the ground, right on the border between San Diego and Tijuana. But let me start with Ryan Nobles, who's up on Capitol Hill. So it's interesting. The, the right hand not talking to the left hand. And by that, I mean the House side is doing something the Senate side's probably not going to do anything with. The Senate side is passing a bill the House side's probably not going to do anything with. And so you, you, you know, do the math on that, and it's deadlock. Yeah, you uh, really summed up what life on Capitol Hill has been like o over the past <laughs> Back eight months. to you, months. Hallie. Thank you, Ryan. <laughs> yeah, exactly, <laughs> Hallie. Uh, and, yeah, I mean, and I think the simple act of impeaching Alejandro Mayorkas, which isn't simple, I don't mean to, to frame it as such, but something you would think Republicans could easily get over the finish line has been a real struggle. And tonight will be an example of whether or not they can even cobble that together, their second crack at this. Uh, and you're right to point out that there's any number of things that could prevent that from happening, people coming in late, uh, they, uh, a flight delay, a sickness. You know, it's based on the number of people who show up, not just the total number of people in the conference. So we expect that they'll have the votes. They should have the votes, but anything could happen uh, to derail that process. But as it relates to the supplemental package, this is one of these weird circumstances, Hallie, where there's actually probably enough votes in the House of Representatives to get this $95 billion package passed. The issue is that House Speaker Mike Johnson is signaling he's not even going to give it an opportunity to get to the floor. And that's something that's very frustrating for the negotiators here on the Senate side who brought this package to life, and also President Biden, who believes it should be passed and then signed into law. Listen to what the president said today. I call on the Speaker to let the full House speak its mind and not allow a minority of most extreme voices in the House to block this bill even from being voted on. And I talked to a bunch of Freedom Caucus Republicans today, and I asked them that question. If this bill came to the floor, would it pass? Yeah. I couldn't get one of them to say, no, it wouldn't pass. So it's clear mm. that this is a tactic that they're using to put pressure on the Speaker to prevent this bill from even getting a vote, even though it likely has enough votes to pass. What's the thing that has surprised you, Ryan, as a longtime uh, watcher and reporter on all things Capitol Hill? What's the thing that surprised you most about these last 72 hours on the Hill? I, I just think that, you know, the fact that there doesn't seem to be an exit strategy here, that they don't have a way to get to something that most people are in favor of. Usually they start at the ends and find their way to the middle. It just doesn't happen in this version of Congress. Ryan Nobles, thank you very much. Live for us there uh, at the Capitol. David, I want to go to you now on the border because talk to us about what you're seeing where you are. This location where migrants have to wait outside for hours to get processed. I mean, where you are, it is the reality for what they're debating, what they're talking about back here where I'm sitting. That's right, Hallie. So just to explain a little bit how this Please. works. about. 
200 or so feet behind this fence that you see is another fence that looks just like it. In that space between those two fences, which is U.S. territory, what, what we've been seeing is large groups of migrants having to wait several hours, oftentimes even overnight. We arrived here actually very early this morning and found a group of about 60 or 70 that reflected how very global migration to the U.S. border is today. There were people from Colombia, Ecuador, Brazil. There were people from Jamaica, from as far away as Mauritania in West Africa. Many of them, like I said, had been waiting here overnight. And on the other side of that fence, there's really nothing. It's it's dirt. There's there's nothing for them to do. No food, no water. There's, I think, a couple of porta potties and that's about it. There's also volunteers here who've been coming here for months because the numbers are the numbers are going up here, right? The, the local sector chief for the San Diego sector posted online that in the first week of uh, February, about 8,600 migrants were apprehended in this sector. If you look week by week, that's higher than it's been here in months. I should say that the numbers border wide are still substantially lower than they were in December, but we're seeing them tick up and we're seeing the traffic patterns sort of shift west to here in California and Arizona. As I was saying, we spoke to some volunteers also who come here in the evenings and in the mornings to offer humanitarian assistance to the migrants who are stuck on the other side of that fence. They give them food, water, hot drinks, uh, you know, just, just basic things that they need for their sustenance. We interviewed one of those volunteers. I asked him if he thinks that the people in D.C. understand what's happening here on the ground. Here's what he said. They are not meeting the national standards, and that's a concern because there are oftentimes vulnerable people who are here, people with injuries or small children that should not be subject to having to wait for an extended amount of time in between two border walls. Ali, even if this impeachment vote goes nowhere, one thing I gathered from talking to migrants today is that what happens in D.C. can trickle down to the border in often unexpected or confusing ways. So whether this impeachment, this failed impeachment, has any kind of consequences here is something we're going to have to pay attention to and find out. It, Ali? It's just so much that butterfly effect. David Noriega, we're so glad to have you there, giving us that perspective. Thank you very much for your reporting. So listen, we talked about President Biden making that push to get the House to approve the Senate's foreign aid package. But he's also slamming the man who may end up his general election rival, Donald Trump, for saying that the Russians can do whatever the hell they want to allies that don't pay enough for NATO. President Biden saying comments like that put the whole world at risk. Trump gave an invitation to Putin to invade some of our allies, NATO allies. For God's sake, it's dumb, it's shameful, it's dangerous, it's un-American. Mr. Trump responding already tonight, saying that NATO nations have to pay their fair share in defense spending. And if they don't, in his words, America first. Kelly O'Donnell is joining us now. And here we are seeing President Biden with that backdrop of the White House, using his commander in chief status to, to issue what, what are some of his sharpest attacks on the former president on this issue of foreign policy. Explain some of the thinking behind this move. Well, in many ways, Hallie, the president is taking this beyond the back and forth over a single piece of legislation and beyond the campaign season to put it in much more stark terms about history and about U.S. credibility around the world. And the very plain spoken way that he attacked Donald Trump is meant to kind of break through. And mm. whether that will or not remains to be seen. But this was jarring in many respects because we watch him very carefully every day. And this yeah. was a strong, uh, pointed uh, set of remarks where he wanted what he had to say to be the message. So he said when he came out, he would not be taking questions. He wanted this to stand alone. In that moment, that did not seem like question avoidance, but a way to try to shine focus on his message. And so this is very stark. And the former president can try to walk back his NATO comments, uh, but the alliance, which has kept much of the world uh, free from war for seven plus decades, uh, is one that requires a careful unity and credibility. And so it's not simply about uh, paying your rate of your GDP to meet the threshold. President Trump, in his time in office, talked about that kind of thing a lot. He urged member nations to spend more. This is about something bigger than that where Joe Biden as president is saying, you're holding the door open for Vladimir Putin to run into Europe. And that is something that the U.S. cannot stand by and allow. So the president is trying to call this out in a much bigger way than the sort of ordinary day-to-day -day, yeah. uh, rhetoric of either governing or the campaign or any of that. So it really stood out because of that, Hallie.
Kelly O'Donnell uh, with that smart reporting, as always, from outside the White House. Kel, thanks. We've got to get to some other breaking news into us now with NBC News learning in just the last couple of minutes that the judge in former President Trump's New York civil fraud trial is expected to lay down a decision on Friday unless something unexpected happens. This is according to somebody with direct knowledge of the situation. So remember, OK, we're looking ahead to Friday. This is the same case where the same judge found back in September that Mr. Trump repeatedly committed fraud by basically overinflating how much he and his company were worth to the tune of billions of dollars. So the judge is now going to decide how much Mr. Trump has to pay in fines, up to $370 million, and whether or not to ban former President Trump from the New York real estate industry for life. Remember, a civil trial, not a criminal one. Looking ahead to Friday on that. You know where you'll find the news that day right here on NBC News Now. Listen, we want to get to some other breaking news happening out of Tennessee. Police now have in their custody the man accused of shooting two sheriff's deputies and killing one of them. Remember, this is a story we told you about last week. There was this big days-long manhunt for the suspect who police described as armed and dangerous. After this all happened at a traffic stop, officials say he chose not to cooperate. Kathy Park is joining us now. There had been a pretty big search for this man after something that shook this community. What else do we know? Hey there, Hallie. Yeah, this certainly is a developing story. Uh, probably in the last couple of hours, we have official confirmation that the fugitive who has been on the run, as you mentioned, for several days is now in custody. Kenneth the Hart Jr. has been arrested right now. We're standing by for a press conference to get some new details as to how this capture all unfolded. But as you mentioned, this all began as a traffic stop on Thursday night. That's when uh, two Blunt County Sheriff's deputies approached the suspect because because according to the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation, he was driving erratically, and that's when things really took a turn and things escalated. Uh, apparently, the suspect did not get out of his vehicle, was not cooperating, and that's when the deputies deployed a taser. And then during this encounter, we're uh, told by authority, that's when the suspect, DeHart Jr., began firing at the deputies, uh, killing Chef Sheriff Deputy Greg McGowan and also injuring Sheriff Deputy Shelby Eggers. She uh, was hospitalized briefly, but is now recovering from her injuries. But Hallie, this certainly has been a tense couple of days. This community has been mourning, grieving the death of one of their own, uh, Sheriff Deputy Greg McGowan. His patrol vehicle is now covered in flowers and personal messages as a sign of the grief of this community. And this comes just ahead of the official funeral for the deputy. But mm. once again, uh, the, the fugitive, Kenneth the Hart Jr., is now in Custody. He was arrested, uh, according to officials, about 20 miles north of where we are in Knoxville, Tennessee. But this is something that several agencies have been on top of. They've been working around the clock ever since Thursday night when this news broke. And the sheriff was adamant. He was confident that he would find the suspect within days. And here we are. But once again, we're standing by for more details as to how this arrest came about. Hallie. Kathy Park, just an active scene there uh, in Tennessee. We'll look for more information as we get it from you throughout the course of the evening. Kathy, thank you for being there. Coming up, a lot more to get to here on the show, including some new court documents detailing what exactly led up to that shooting at a Houston megachurch, the warning signs, and who they came from. Plus, later, what researchers think this huge megastructure under the Baltic Sea really is. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, Boeing's deliveries are down after a series of plane problems. I know you remember when that Alaska Airlines plane saw its door plug blow out mid-flight. Now, Boeing says it sent out just 27 planes last month, the lowest number since September. Boeing says it's going to get its act together and work on quality and safety. Number two, King Charles flying back to London today for what may be more treatment for cancer. He came from the Royals Estate in Eastern England, where he went to church over the weekend. His first time in public since his cancer diagnosis was announced. Number three, right about now, people are heading out to the polls in Indonesia to vote in the presidential election there. But instead of filling in a little circle, they're using a hammer and nails to make their picks. The officials said that's because some people there don't really use pens or pencils. It's the third biggest democracy in the world. Both China and the U.S. want influence in the area. If nobody wins 50% of the vote, they'll have a runoff in June. 
And before the FDA, the makers of this Chicken Street Taco Meal Kit are recalling it because of possible listeria contamination. This is Rizzo Lopez Foods, and they've already seen some other dairy products re recalled. The FDA says nobody was reported getting nobody reported getting sick from the kit, I should say. People can return it for a refund. Number five, researchers found a bunch of stones lined up at the bottom of the Baltic Sea. Turns out it was probably a wall built during the Stone Age 10,000 years ago. It might have been used for hunting reindeer. You can see a 3D model of part of it here. Researchers say it could be Europe's oldest megastructure. It could change the way we think about hunter-gatherers from back in the day. Let's take it to Texas now, because some court documents just into us are giving us new details on what may have led a woman to open fire inside a Houston church over the weekend, a Houston megachurch led by celebrity pastor Joel Osteen. These court documents from 2022 say the shooter intentionally hurt her son at least two times. Remember, that little boy, now seven years old, was hurt in the shooting. He is now fighting for his life, according to officials, in critical condition. Now, in 2021, the shooter's ex-husband told a court that she, the attacker, would physically attack him and on multiple occasions chased him out of the house with knives. The boy's grandmother, who's the shooter's ex-mother-in-law, tells uh, the, Houston station, the Houston station KHOU in an exclusive interview that her family tried to get her help. There were red flags for six years, and we raised them, and we flew them high, and nothing was done. All of that potentially having something to do with these scary scenes when the shooter sent people running for their lives in a situation that ended with that little seven-year-old in critical condition. A 57-year-old man was also hurt. He has been released from the hospital. The attacker was killed by two off-duty officers working security at the church. Tom Winter is joining us now. So, Tom, a lot of new info coming into us from these court documents. That new interview, of course, with the grandmother. It seems like the warning signs had been building really for years, and yet she was able to have a gun. How'd that happen? The, that's right, Hallie. And able to have a gun, and apparently at one point, according to that deposition and according to those court documents, had stored the gun in the three then three-year-old, her three-year-old son's diaper bag, just to give you a sense of what was going on there in that household. I think when you look at it, the grandmother also made a Facebook post saying uh, the fault lives in the Child Protective Services of Montgomery County, which is north of Houston, and Harris County, which is where Houston is. They refused to uh, remove from custody uh, a woman with known mental illness illness in this son who is now seven years old and is lying in a hospital in an extremely critical condition. You know, when you look at this case in its totality, Hallie, um, there's certainly appear to be a number of warning signs. But of course, at some point, you need to apply the law to it from law enforcement. Look, this will take some time to figure out whether or not steps were missed here, whether or not there were adequate laws in place uh, to be able to make sure this individual didn't have a gun. And it's something today that we spoke to a uh, former ATF special agent in charge charge as to exactly some of the factors that go into this. Even if you have gone and sought mental health treatment on your own, or you've been taken into police custody for 24 hours or 48 hours, that is not going to prevent people from possessing firearms in virtually every state in the country. And in Texas is one example, Hallie, they do not have an emergency risk order or a uh, so-called red flag order. They have a working group in Houston that's examined that, but it's not something that's a state law, so it's not clear what steps anybody could have taken to ultimately determine this person shouldn't have guns, and that's something that's certainly frustrating for a lot of people. What else are we finding out from these court documents that are coming into us now, Tom? Right. So as we've laid out, just the concerning issues about whether or sure. not this child should have been in her custody in the first place. And that's, I think, one of the things that's coming clear. Where this all goes from a standpoint of motive, that's still very much in the air. You know, initially, when the information came out about this, uh, there was there was talk about, is this a terrorist attack? Because Palestine was written on the gun. There was apparently a dispute uh, with family members who are the Jewish faith. So could this have been uh, anti-Semitic? And there were writings to that effect. So this could this be a hate? crime. Now, when we step back and we know the full history of this person, or at least what's publicly available in these documents, thanks to our team in Texas and team back here in New York, I think when you look at it, you say, okay, this person has an enormous history uh, with mental health concerns. It's documented according to police. We're seeing it here now. Uh, so when we put this all together, what are we really talking about? And was there really a motive or a cause here, or just something that this person's mental condition had broken down so much that led to this point? Point. Either way, a scary situation on Sunday, Hallie. No kidding. Tom Winter, thank you very much for bringing all that new information to us tonight. Appreciate it. When we come back, something you've got to see to believe. We'll show you a bit more on the other side.
NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day, and because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what the TELUS is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. Out of our Western Bureau, a man in Alaska has now become the first person to die from what's called Alaska pox, according to health officials there. There have been six other cases in the state since 2015. The health department says the man had a weakened immune system, which probably made the infection worse. Officials say Alaska pox is related to smallpox and may jump from animals to humans. Also about our Western Bureau, look at this. New video shows somebody paragliding off a skyscraper in LA. This is the same abandoned building that got covered in graffiti a couple days ago. I want to show it to you here. You're going to see the person, oh, they just jump. Then they deploy the chute, thank goodness. They're now going to guard the site to make sure nobody else gets in. Some urban paragliding for you there. Oof. At our Midwest Bureau, police in Kansas arresting somebody who stole, they say, that bronze statue of Jackie Robinson last month. Remember this? It was cut off. Only the shoes were left, cut off at the ankles. It was later found burned up in a dumpster. Uh, police say that the thieves wanted to sell the metal for scrap. They say there was no evidence this was a hate-motivated crime and do believe more arrests will be coming. Overseas now, we're just learning an American citizen has been killed in the occupied West Bank, with the State Department confirming that in just the last couple of hours. The U.S. says it's working with Israel to gather more information about how this happened. Mohammed Kador's father tells NBC News his son was shot in the head by Israeli forces when he was heading back home from a picnic with some friends and family, making that 17-year-old the second American teenager killed in the West Bank in about a month. I want to bring in Raf Sanchez in Tel Aviv. What else do we know about this particular situation? So, Hali Mohammed Hador, as you said, 17 years old, he was attending high school in the occupied West Bank, just outside of Jerusalem, but his family, based in Miami, Florida, and they say on Saturday, about 4.30 p.m. local time, he was out with friends having a picnic near Jerusalem. They say Israeli forces opened fire on the car that he was traveling in. He was hit in the head by one of those rounds. Now, we asked the Israeli military earlier about this shooting. Kind of unusually, Hallie, they referred us to the Shin Bet, Israel's domestic security agency. We haven't yet had an answer from them about what happened here. But as you mentioned, this is the second young Palestinian American killed in the West Bank in the last month or so. The other 70 17-year-old Tafiq Abdul-Jabbar, who was born and raised in Louisiana. No one has been arrested in his killing. And Halley Human Rights Groups will tell you that there is a long history of Palestinians, be they Americans or not, being killed in the West Bank with very little follow-up, very little investigation, and very little accountability into their deaths. Halley. Can you give us a picture, too, more broadly in the region here? Because we're also just learning that South Africa is putting in this urgent request to the U.N.'s top court to try to get them to intervene in some of the deadly attacks that Israel is launching in Rafah, the southernmost city in the Gaza Strip. Walk us through that. Yeah, Hallie, so viewers will remember, South Africa went to the International Court of Justice. They accused Israel of committing genocide in Gaza, an accusation Israel denies. But the court issued what they call provisional measures, basically saying Israel needs to take all precautions to make sure that its forces are not committing genocide in Gaza. And today, the South Africans went back to the court and they said, look, if Israel does launch this attack on Rafah, where half the population of Gaza, some 1.4 million people are sheltering, it would be a violation of the court's order. Now, Hallie, as we've talked about before, the court has very limited ability to actually enforce its rulings. So it's not clear the judges who sit on this court are actually going to be able to do anything about this looming Israeli offensive in Rafah. But we did hear from the president yesterday, speaking alongside the King of Jordan, saying the U.S. does not support an Israeli offensive into Rafah unless there is a credible plan to to get those civilians to safety. The UN and other humanitarian groups are saying there is simply nowhere for these people to run. Hallie. Raf Sanchez live for us there in Tel Aviv tonight. Raf, thank you. Coming up, Nikki Haley calling out former President Trump's push to try to reshape who runs the GOP as we're learning more from the former president's son-in-law about whether he'd take a job in a potential second term. That's next. Donald Trump tonight taking another step to try to remake the Republican Party in his image, rolling out the three people he wants to take over the party's organizing and fundraising apparatus. They are one of the big-time backers of his lies about his 2020 election loss, a close campaign advisor, and his daughter-in-law, Laura Trump.
His only remaining opponent, his only remaining serious opponent in this race, Nikki Haley in the primary, is clapping back from her hometown in South Carolina. Think about what's happening right now. Is that how you're going to try and take an election? That's all this polling shows. She is trailing Mr. Trump in her home state of South Carolina. Look at that, 65% to 30%, which is about two weeks, not even, to the primary. Garrett Hake is live for us on the Hill. Interesting game plan here by Nikki Haley, right? Increasingly personal in her attacks as Donald Trump is trying to take another step to bring together the GOP in his name, if you will, with his loyalists. Yeah, I think that's right, Hallie. I mean, here you see Donald Trump trying to look past Nikki Haley, taking steps that you do normally see a nominee take, but typically when they're the nominee, or at least when they're the presumptive nominee after a primary is over, by trying to force this consolidation of the institutional Republican Party behind him even now, he chokes off her options even further. Nikki Haley running a much more aggressive campaign now in South Carolina than she really did at any point during this contest up until now. You could argue it's too late. But the problem here is also that we have seen through ample polling that going after Donald Trump directly can also make you less popular with the kind of base Republican voters who are deciding things in states like Iowa and states like New Han or excuse me, South Carolina that she has to win now. So tricky politics for her as Donald Trump is trying to basically say, I'm over this part of the race. I'm already looking ahead to Joe Biden. So, it, and like, let's say he's looking ahead to a potential second term, too. There, there is somebody, a, a loyalist, if you will, who sounds like he won't be a part of his administration. Jared Kushner, his son-in-law, obviously a former senior advisor in the first term, was asked about this in a brand new interview with Axios in just the last hour. Let me play a little bit of that exchange. So is that a no? If he calls you on November whatever and says, I'd like to come back to see you say, thanks, but I'm good? Yes. Uh, you know, from, from my perspective, uh, again, if you look at the way President Trump has been handling his campaign this time, uh, this is his third time doing it. And he's had time um, to uh, to really reflect on everything. I think that the team around him is, is maybe the best he's had. What's so interesting here, right, is the Jared Kushner of it all, somebody who was um, very much engaged in the White House operations in, in some ways and disengaged in others, based on all the reporting over the mm -hmm. course of the last, you know, many years. A That's right. Kind of a lightning rod, you know, uh, for some of those in the former president's inner circle. People loved him or they sure did not love him. Now he's kind of saying, well, I'm doing all these investment, like I'm, I've got this investing thing going on, like I'm good. And talking about the way that he sees his father-in-law's political operation running in the future. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple pieces to that, Hallie. Uh, number one, most Republicans I talk to agree with the sentiment that this Trump campaign is the most well-run of his three presidential campaigns. They like the team around him. They like the way that that team has been able to balance the competing uh, issues here of letting Trump be Trump and also running a campaign that could at least theoretically win in a general election and not alienate the people in the middle to win over the people on the right that uh, Trump appeals to kind of more naturally. The idea of Kushner not being involved in a second Trump campaign uh, White House is interesting because given his role as the president's son-in-law, the stuff he says to the president, if he were to be president again, would still carry enormous weight whether he has a formal role or not, right? What he says at brunch on a Sunday morning is just as important to Donald Trump as what his paid advisors might mm. say. And I think you heard Kushner kind of expand on this idea of why he wouldn't come back but could potentially still be influential in some more remarks from that same interview. There's been a lot more time for people to think about the policies. I think he has a much better understanding of who was effective in all these different roles. Uh, and I suspect he'll have a, a very, very long list of very qualified people uh, to choose from from all the different uh, jobs. So you see, because you're talking about the team that is potentially available to Donald Trump, I mark my words, uh, Hallie, if Donald Trump does win the presidency, Kushner doesn't need a formal role to still be influential in that White House. Garrett Haig, live for us there on the Hill. Uh, Garrett, thank you. Lots to talk about, I know, uh, as it relates to the campaign tonight. I appreciate it. So listen, as Nikki Haley fights to stay in this race, to try to make her case against former President Trump, she's going after him as a tax raiser, in her words, and soft on Russia in a new commercial, boosting her ad buys to $6 million in her home state of South Carolina and announcing plans for her campaign in Super Tuesday states today. By all accounts, right, all indications that she, at least right now, is planning to stay in this race. Over the last few months, our NBC News campaign embed, Sarah Dean, has been talking with Haley voters on the campaign trail to see what's driving their vote. Watch. 
Nikki Haley has the vitality that I don't see with Biden, and she has the honesty and integrity I don't see with Trump. I like the fact that she's willing to call out the Republicans and the Democrats. I just trust her. Nikki Haley, now the last woman standing, with all other challengers to former President Donald Trump out of the GOP primary race. I want some young blood in there, and I'd love to see a lady president before I die. Over months, we've spoken with dozens of Haley supporters. What draws them to the former UN ambassador and South Carolina governor? For many, it's her experience. With her experience the United Nations, I think she brings a lot to the table. And supporters think if she's going to gain any momentum against the front runner, she has to do it in her home state. The best chance she has is here. 48-year-old Rich Tasson of Charleston, South Carolina, says he voted Democrat in the last election and has never voted in a GOP primary before. But he plans to cast his ballot for Haley at the end of the month. Haley's the only hope if we have any respect for the actual GOP, for the Republican Party. I, I really I really believe that. Haley says the Republican Party needs to appeal to independent-minded voters like Rich in order to win in a general election, an argument many of her supporters echo. I think she appeals to moderates and independents, and I think Trump will alienate those voters. Haley's going after people like 64-year-old retired mechanic Jackie Weidman, he hasn't voted in years and has never attended a political rally. So this is all new music to me. But in Maudlin, South Carolina, he stood on stage alongside Haley with a sign. I haven't seen nobody in 15 or almost 20 years that was worthy of my vote. And I hope to, uh, and pray that the people of the United States will start looking uh, in another direction instead of toward these colossal fossils, as I call them. Elizabeth Cole of Charleston, South Carolina, has a similar story. This is actually the first political event I've ever been to, first t-shirt I've ever worn, because I just really believe in what Nikki represents. If there's one thing most Haley supporters I spoke with agree on, they don't like Trump, even if they voted for him twice. It's too much luggage. <laughs> I don't want the drama, and Donald had his chance. I voted for him, now I want to move on to someone else. The chaos, it, was, it just got to be to the point where it was so detrimental that it wasn't worth it, and as a Trump supporter, having to defend some of the stupid things he said, I could not him. Sarah Dean, NBC News. Our thanks to Sarah for that report. Some other breaking news we're getting in literally the last five minutes or so. The defense secretary, Lloyd Austin, is now out of the hospital. The Pentagon says he has now fully resumed his duties. Remember, we told you about this last night on the show. Austin had to go to Walter Reed Medical Center for a bladder issue that forced him to cancel a trip to Europe. He'd been treated for prostate cancer back in December. That created some fallout because the president didn't know that there were complications from a surgery. We're going to have more details for you from this Pentagon briefing and the Pentagon information as we get it. Still to come, why Paramount, which owns CBS, is laying off hundreds of people even after getting record Super Bowl ratings. One of the world's oldest media companies at a crossroads tonight with Paramount announcing it's going to fire 800 people. That's something like 3% of the company. The timing's super interesting here. Paramount owns CBS, which, as you probably heard, just had the Super Bowl, and that did a huge number, more than 123 million viewers across all of Paramount's platforms. Eight million more people watched this year than last year, and it had more viewers than any other TV program ever except for the moon landing. Back in 1969, how about that? Moon landing, Taylor Bowl, top two. As an added bonus, Paramount raked in an additional 35 million bucks. Why? Because of those overtime ads. More football means more money, but apparently not enough to stop the bleeding at Paramount. Chloe Malas is joining us now. They got a lot of buzz with some of these innovative ideas like that Nickelodeon broadcast of the Super Bowl when, like, SpongeBob was at the anchor desk going after my job and your job. But as we're seeing here, big numbers do not always mean big profits. First of all, my kids loved that, and that was a fun way to introduce them to the Super Bowl. They're four years old and six years old, so kudos to Paramount for that <laughs> uh, creative thinking. But here's the deal. So although so many people watch the Super Bowl, this is just a fluke thing because mm. next year, CBS, they're not going to have the Super Bowl. Another network is, and that's the way it works every single year. Yes, they saw 120 million people watching the Super Bowl just on CBS, not to mention all the other sister 
sister networks that they own, like Nick Logo, Paramount, Univision Logo, that also streamed and aired the Super Bowl. Now, Bob Backish, the CEO of Paramount Global, came out and said this, these adjustments will help enable us to build on our momentum and execute our strategic vision for the year ahead. And I firmly believe that we have much to be excited about. Now, we knew in the media that these layoffs were coming as of a couple months ago. So the two are not mutually exclusive. You can have record ratings for the Super Bowl on CBS while also making the company leaner. Right. And the big question is why Paramount has seen big losses, $238 million in losses from their Paramount Plus subscription streaming program, a uh, streaming service. And also, even though they have more subscribers to that platform, they're still seeing huge losses, Hallie. Th that said, the Super Bowl numbers are a way to kind of make the pro put the product on a on a pedestal, if you will. You're seeing Paramount do things like bring Jon Stewart back to The Daily Show. He just debuted last night. Th is the thinking that that kind of thing make them more would make them more appealing in a sale? So that's the big question. Sherry Redstone, the daughter of Sumner Redstone, she owns 10% of CBS Paramount. Is she going to merge with perhaps a Warner Brothers Discovery? Now, Axios broke that story, Sarah Fisher. Um, and we know that, uh, you know, also CNBC has reported that there are talks happening between Paramount to potentially merge. And what would happen and why are they making this workforce leaner? Now, I spoke to media analysts and authors of hoax Brian Stelter just moments ago. I know he was on your program last yeah. week and he says, it's one thing to make it leaner, Hallie. It's another thing to look malnourished. And that at the end of the day, they have to execute. They are a news organization. They have a million different platforms. Like, let's talk about some of them. Paramount Pictures logo, CBS logo, CBS News logo, Showtime logo, Pluto TV logo. So you don't want to get too lean where you can't get the job done. And then maybe you're not as appealing for someone to acquire you. It's that fine line. They got to be walking here. Chloe Malas, thank you so much for all of your reporting tonight. As always, appreciate it. That does it for us for this hour. We've got more coverage picking up right now. Coming on the air with the biggest Dow sell-off in nearly a year, just 24 hours after a new record high. Roller coaster ride on Wall Street after new warning signs, inflation's not slowing as fast as the experts expected. How the cost of eating out turns out to be eating into your wallet more than anything else. More on that in just a minute. Also tonight, a deadly snowstorm shutting down pretty much the whole Northeast. Thousands of people stranded in cars or at airports. We're live with what's happening as we speak and what is next here. That snow, not stopping voters on Long Island, making their pick to replace controversial former Congressman George Santos. But this race is bigger than just that one seat in the House. How what happens tonight could help us read the tea leaves for November. Plus, the new court documents our team is just now getting in Texas, showing that the woman who opened fire in a Houston megachurch intentionally hurt her child in the past. Her seven-year-old son, who was shot, now fighting for his life. Plus, the new interview with his grandmother about the warning signs she saw. And any minute now, Republicans are expected to take another shot at trying to impeach President Biden's top immigration official. We'll take you there and live to the border with a gut check on the humanitarian crisis a little bit later on in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and tonight it is whiplash on Wall Street, going from a record high 24 hours ago to its worst day in almost a year tonight. Look at this, the Dow, the S&P, the NASDAQ, all in the red. You see it on screen there. Why? New numbers showing us inflation may be more stubborn than we thought. That has investors worried that the Fed's not going to be able to cut rates many more times this year because we're seeing inflation go down a bit, but not quickly enough. At 3.1%, it's less than what it was in December, but it's really not where the expectation was, where people had wanted it to be. How is it affecting your wallet? Well, take a look at the numbers here. The essentials are still right around the same price they were last year. Eggs, bread, pretty much the same. Gas is down a little bit, same with milk, but just by a few cents. Brian Chung is joining us now. What is up with this roller coaster ride, Brian? We know that the markets, right, is not the economy at the same time. I mean, this is, um, it's t I think it's tough for people at home to maybe keep track of here. It's tough for people in the studios to keep track of. Walk us through it. 
Yeah, well, stubborn was one way to describe it. Frustrating was what another analyst had used to describe this report. But again, let's take that 3.1% figure that you mentioned and put it into context. So, yes, that is an improvement from the 9.1% we saw in the summer of 2022. And look at that momentum that we had into the middle of last year. And then basically since then, we've essentially been going sideways. So, yeah, 3.4% was the last figure that we had seen in December. 3.1% is an improvement, but we really want to see this somewhere closer to 2%. And what accounted for a lot of the uh, inflation in this particular report was shelter, which was the cost of just putting a roof over your head, rents and also mortgages, but it was also food. Food prices continue to go up on a monthly basis. And even when you unpack that, where was it getting more expensive, at the restaurant or at home? Well, the answer was both. So when you look at full service restaurants, for example, uh, prices went up by 4.3% uh, just between January of this year and January of last year at limited service food spots. Like, let's say, for example, you just go to a takeout window, you grab the burger, those prices went up by 5.8%. So you're not really getting a lot of reprieve when it comes to food. And I think that explains some of the sentimental reasons why people are saying, all right, well, I see the numbers here, but I might not be feeling that in my pocket yet. Although important to note, Hallie, that more recent readings of consumer sentiment have been on the uptick recently. Yeah, that's the thing. Is that it seems like some of that pessimism is starting to fade away a little bit. But, it, but as you look at these numbers here for the things, eggs, bread, milk, as we showed people, um, it, it doesn't feel like there's much of an impact in our wallets, right? The Fed wants to see inflation down even further. Talk us through what this looks like over the months to come. Yeah, well, I mean, and for that, we need to provide a little bit of retrospective on what they've been doing over the last two years. And what they've been doing is going on a long, long, high hike up to the mountains, right, if you will. So that's because as inflation was rising, they were saying, OK, how do we take steam out of this economy? Well, we can do it by raising borrowing costs. So in 2022, not only were they raising interest rates, they were doing it by large magnitudes, three quarters of a percentage point at a time. They were tapering off and then they ultimately stopped raising interest rates around the end of the summer last year. They haven't raised interest rates rates since then, which has had conversations of, okay, well, as we saw that improvement in inflation, would they then start to cut interest rates? Maybe that's the next step. Yeah, they've been pausing. Maybe in, let's say, for example, the uh, March or May meeting, they could cut interest rates. Well, this report shows you that they still have a little bit of work to do to get down to that 2% level, which is right here, uh, which is what they want to see. So for that reason, maybe they don't do that interest rate cut that people were expecting until June or perhaps July is what some analysts were saying today. Either way, that's going to be a, a unwelcome news to Americans who are hoping maybe they could get into the mortgage market and maybe they would uh, not yeah. have to suffer from these high credit card rates, which, by the way, is related to what the Federal Reserve has done over the last two years. Brian Chung, thank you very much for that breakdown. Appreciate it. Got to take you now to Tennessee where we have some breaking news. Police now have in their custody the man accused of shooting two sheriff's deputies and killing one of them. We are just minutes away now from an update from law enforcement with the suspect taken into custody outside a home earlier today. Look at that photograph there. This is a story we told you about last week. There was this days-long manhunt for the suspect described as armed and dangerous. After all of this happened at a traffic stop, officials say he chose not to cooperate. That is when one of the deputies was killed. Kathy Park is joining us now. There was a big search for this man. The community was shaken up, and now here we are. He is apparently in custody, and officers are about to brief us in just the next couple of minutes. Walk us through. That's absolutely right. It certainly has been a dramatic few hours here in Maryville, Tennessee. But I can tell you that the Tennessee fugitive, Kenneth DeHart Jr., is now officially in custody. We're told that he was processed here at the Blount County Sheriff's Department moments ago, but was transferred to a nearby jail for his safety. But right now, as you mentioned, we're standing by for a press conference. It's supposed to happen uh, any minute now, so we should have some more details as to how this arrest actually came about. But we know it happened about 20 miles north of here in Knoxville, Tennessee, early Earlier this afternoon. But, Hal, you mentioned this all happened Thursday night, a traffic stop, and things quickly escalated and took a tragic turn. According to the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation, Kenneth Hart Jr. was stopped for erratic driving, and there were two deputies who stopped him Deputy Greg McGowan and Deputy Shelby Eggers. And there was a point when uh, Kenneth Hart Jr. would not get out of his vehicle. He was not cooperating. That's when the deputies pulled out a taser. Um, and when that didn't work, at one point, that is when DeHart Jr. Jr. pulled out his firearm, began shooting, um, ended up shooting Greg McCowan and injuring Shelby Eggers. And this is the memorial, the growing memorial for the slain deputy. And this has been going for several days now. It is covered in flowers.
flowers and personal messages. And Hallie, this is just a sign of the grief of this community. And tomorrow is actually the official funeral service for Deputy Greg McGowan. But there is some closure knowing that the suspect is now behind bars. Shortly after the announcement of his arrest, this community, uh, there were several people who lined the street here in front of the sheriff's department. They were clapping, they were cheering, they were rallying uh, behind this community for a speedy arrest and also rallying behind the family of Greg McGowan. Hallie, Kathy Park, live for us there in Maryville. Kathy, thank you very much. We'll keep an eye on, obviously, the updates that we expect to see, and I know she'll have more for us tonight. Elsewhere in the Northeast now, the kind of storm that area hasn't seen in years has now turned deadly, killing one person with roads and flights and power grids, all really messy. People are starting to dig out after snow. Look at this, just blanketed cities. In Pennsylvania alone, you have nearly 80,000 people without power and seemingly whiteout conditions, making driving kind of a nightmare. Look at that coming down. PA State Police say they responded to more than 1,200 crashes or stuck cars. And in one town in that state, a person died when he collided with a downed power line while on a snowmobile. In the air, something like 1,200 canceled flights today, 2,000 flights delayed because of ground stops. And in New York City, look at this, plows on the streets for the first time in two years. NBC's Emily Aketa earlier today watching what happens when roads don't get cleared up fast enough. Plows at times having trouble keeping up with the pace of the snowfall, making roadways treacherous. Take a look at this car that slid off the roadway into this embankment, almost down into the ravine below. Emily is joining us now from New Jersey. Meteorologist Bill Karens is joining us as well. Emily, let me start with you. And listen, that's a scary moment that you just showed there. It could have been obviously far worse for that particular driver. And it's been a minute since places in the Northeast have seen this kind of snow. Yeah, absolutely. It's an excellent point, and it's why officials were encouraging people to stay at home if possible, especially during those early morning hours during the morning commute. It's been a bit of weather whiplash for so many people across the Northeast. The snowy backdrop behind me certainly in sharp contrast to those near record high temperatures we saw over the weekend. And those high temperatures, they are playing a role in the cleanup process from this massive sto snowstorm. You think about it, the ground temperatures are warm, so it decreases how much snow can accumulate on the ground and also leads a lends itself to allowing snow to melt even faster. So good news there. But regardless, across the Northeast and here in New Jersey, parts of Pennsylvania, also Connecticut, hammered with more than a foot of snow with this massive snow. And then also the snowfall rates sometimes one to two inches an hour. And that is why officials were so concerned about the treacherous driving conditions. You said it, more than 1,200 car crashes. Pennsylvania State Police responded to across the state um, uh, today alone. Also, then you look at from the roadway to the runway, air travel also snarled. More than 1,200 flight cancellations across the country. LaGuardia, Boston, JFK, Newark, among some of the hardest hit airports. Some airlines are offering travel waivers for impacted travelers. Hallie? Emily Aketa live for us there in Jersey uh, in Ridgewood. Emily, thank you. Let me bring in meteorologist Bill Karens. Is the storm pretty much passed through? Is it, is it out and done? Gone. Uh, it's even clear in Cape Cod at this time. So, you know, the problem now is the areas that it snowed, then stopped. Sun even came out, got a little warmer, it melted, and now temperatures started going in the 20s. And so then we're going to get a refreezing and black ice. So, uh, it'll be a treacherous early morning. We may even get school delays tomorrow too to give people extra time to clear up. So, we did have over a foot in a couple states. So, this there was a, a boom in some areas. I-95. This was not a big snowstorm for you. Uh, hardly anything. D.C., Boston, Philly. New York and Central Park was three inches, but if you weren't in a park in New York, you're like, where was the three inches? It was melting everywhere on all the sidewalks and roads. Providence had a little more. Uh, and then the next storm, this is not a big, huge ordeal. This thing will slide as we go throughout the Great Lakes. It does look like we will pick up a little bit of snow in areas of the Northeast. Nothing too heavy, but we will get some isolated one to three inch totals. This is going to be as we go throughout tomorrow and into Thursday. Even Chicago, Green Bay, Milwaukee, a little coating of snow. Detroit, just enough to make it a little slippery times and then through the northeast higher elevations will get up to four to five inches but hartford boston albany just about one to three and that'll most likely be thursday night into friday morning and then hallie the other story we're going to be talking about as the week progresses we're getting very active out in the pacific there's one two three four storms lined up and these are all heading for california so they're already saying okay here we go again so as we go through friday every uh, higher locations elevated and especially northern california two to three 
three inches. Snowfall totals will also be up too. But the biggest storm alley will be Sunday night, Monday into Tuesday. This one, they're already calling for three inches of rain in LA again. More mudslides, more debris flows. But again, that's about four or five days away. Bill Karens, thanks for keeping an eye on all of it. Appreciate it. That snowstorm hitting voters in the third congressional district of New York who are deciding right now who they want to replace indicted former Congressman George Santos. Only a few more hours left to vote. And right now it's been a close race between Democrat Tom Swazi. He's on the left. He used to rep the district. And on the right, Republican Mozzie Hillup. Here's what people said they voted on. Police, you know, I want some safe streets. And the crime has really been up on the island lately. I would say illegal immigration, economy, uh, foreign policy. If Swazi wins, he's the Democrat, and if he wins, it would mean that in the House of Representatives, Republicans would have even less of the very close, the very tight, the very paper-thin majority they already have. It's also, the whole race is seen as kind of a message test, if you will, for the November election. What works? What doesn't? Will Republicans be able to bring home a win campaigning on immigration, or can Democrats leverage other issues like abortion or guns or democracy? Then, of course, that weather wild card. Will today's storm keep anybody away? I want to bring in Sahil Kapoor, who's live for us at the watch party for Swazi. Uh, I would ask you about the vibe in the room. I believe the vibe is empty at the moment because polls are open for several more hours yet. Talk me through what you're hearing from voters as you were out at some polling locations today, Sahil. Yeah, that's right, Hallie. I would say the vibe in the room is early. <laughs> Tom Swazi is not here yet. Voters in New York are continuing to vote. Uh, until 9 p.m. Remember, if you're in line at 9 p.m., you are allowed to cast your ballot. Now, earlier today, we talked to a lot of voters at a, at a polling location uh, near this place, and it's very striking. A lot of the issues that they're bringing up are the very same national issues that are being fought in bellwether districts and battleground states all over the country. Immigration and crime kept coming up again and again, particularly as issues that Republicans are concerned about. Uh, the issue of abortion rights is a big one for Democrats. Fighting extremism, good government, another big issue for Democrats. Let's play a cut of what some voters told me earlier today. I'm Jewish, and the, uh, the Israeli issue is important to me. Uh, the immigration issue is important to me. I think it's not good for us to pay all those taxes and this, all these illegal immigrants are coming. I'm an immigrant myself, but I pay my fair share. I pay a lot of taxes. Now, a recent Siena College poll found this to be a tight race. Tom Swazi led the Republican Mazi Pellet by just four points, which was just inside the poll's margin of error. Let's take a look at the issues that... Uh, and, and how they broke down. The, on the issue of migration and addressing that, Mazi Pellup led by nine points. That is the single biggest political weapon that Republicans feel that they have. If you turn on your TV, that is the issue that most of these ads are being fought over. Tom Swazi is taking that very seriously. He's got ads in heavy rotation trying to defend himself, fight back, point out his votes in the past uh, to break with the left of his party and support ICE. We'll see how that bears, Hallie. I think that could be a decisive one. You can see on the issue of uh, dealing with abortion, Tom Swazi has a huge 23-point uh, advantage on some other issues as well, he has an advantage. This will be a test case of the Republican message of, of migration and the border, well, crime, a backlash as well to New York City politics and Albany, whether that's going to be enough to keep this district red. Pull the thread on that test case issue, Sahil, because loyal viewers of this show know that you wear multiple hats, right? Your other hat, of course, is as our congressional reporter, one of them over on Capitol Hill near where I'm sitting here. Extrapolate why today matters so much for what we could see in November. What a win for Dems or a win for Republicans could really look like and the implications there. Yeah, this is the first glimpse of Democrats trying to go on offense on the border mm. issue, trying to neutralize what has been a huge political vulnerability for them. And the way Tom Swazi is trying to do that is that there was a bipartisan deal recently struck on Capitol Hill to toughen asylum and border security laws. It was demanded by Republicans. They appointed a negotiator, Senator James Lankford. They cut a deal with the blessing of Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, and Republicans immediately knifed it. They rejected it. They said it was not good enough. Former President Trump had been pushing many of them to reject it as well. And Mazi Pillup came out against that deal, like most of the rest of her party. And Tom Swazi argues that this is simply Republicans trying to play political games, not fix a problem that they created. Is this going to actually neutralize that vulnerability for Democrats? Uh, or even fight it to a draw? Probably not. I think the Democratic vulnerability is too weak on this. But if he can cut into that advantage and convince voters here, swing voters who do want to fix the problem, that Republicans are just trying to use it to play political games, uh, the complexion of this race could change pretty dramatically with voters who are worried about that. Hallie? Sahil Kapoor, live first there in Seattle. Sahil, thank you. I'm sure we'll be checking back in with you throughout the night as the results start to roll in.
Elsewhere here in Washington, just minutes from now, House Republicans are going to try for a do-over, if you will, voting again to attempt to impeach the Homeland Security Secretary. You're taking a live look now at the House floor. House Republicans seem to be feeling a little bit better about their odds this time, since one of their members who was being treated for cancer during last week's failed vote is now back in D.C. So failed last week. They're trying again tonight. Keep in mind that there is that slim majority we just talked about with Sahil, meaning that any Republican absence tonight, somebody getting sick, somebody missing their flight, could put this vote in jeopardy for Republicans. Okay, let's say it does pass, right? Even if it does pass, it's essentially DOA in the Senate anyway. Senate Democrats and a bunch of Republicans, they would rather the House spend time on something else. And that's this big $95 billion aid package that the Senate just passed overnight. It's got aid to Ukraine, to Israel, humanitarian aid for Gazans. But the message from President Biden coming straight from the White House that this needs to get done. Watch. I call on the speaker to let the full House speak its mind and not allow a minority of most extreme voices in the House to block this bill even from being voted on. Remember, this is the bill that was supposed to address issues on the border, but the border funding piece of it got stripped away. But the issues along the border have not, with some sections seeing some significant upticks in migrant encounters in just the last few weeks. David Noriega is there along the border between San Diego and Tijuana, but I want to start here in Washington with Julie Serkin, who's on Capitol Hill. I haven't, I've been doing the show, Julie, I haven't looked at my email, but I think we're just minutes away from this vote now, this second attempt to try to impeach Alejandro Mayorkas coming down any second. Walk us through it. Yeah, exactly. It'll start in the next 45 minutes. Hallie, what a perfect segue from New York 3 on Long Island there to here in Capitol Hill. That's because that election not only matters in November, but it matters right now. And there is a reason this vote, this do-over attempt to impeach Alejandro Mayorkas is happening tonight. And it's because Republicans are very well aware that their shrinking majority can shrink uh, even further if Mazi Pillup does not win to Tom Suozzi. And that seat uh, that Santos held before, of course, uh, flips in Democrats' control. Who better to ask whether this vote tonight will actually pass than the vote counter on the House Republican side of the field, Tom Emmer. Take a listen to what he had to say earlier today on this very question. There's always concerns, but no, it will pass. All Republicans will be back. Again, with Steve Scalise back, remember he was out for cancer treatment. Republicans do feel like the second shot after that spectacular failure and embarrassment on the floor last week, they feel like they will be successful. But to your point, Hallie, any absence, somebody gets sick, the weather certainly that was up and down today across the country could affect their margins. And then if and when they do pass this effort on the House floor, you're right to point out that Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer said this would be dead on arrival in the Senate, Hallie. Julie Serkin, lots to watch in the next 45 minutes, as you say, when that vote begins. David Noriega, let's go to you now here, because I wonder how people where you are there along the border see the political point that Republicans in the House are trying to make tonight with the impeachment of the Homeland Security Secretary. Hallie, the, the way that what happens in D.C. trickles down to the border is often very garbled and not exactly easy to predict. Here's what I can tell you. So so where I'm standing now is on the other side of that fence is uh, a, a sort of de facto open air detention site that Border Patrol has been using to gather migrants in some cases for many hours at a time before they move them to other places for processing. We were here early this morning and I got a chance to speak to several migrants who've been waiting here uh, for several hours and I asked some of them what, if anything, have you been hearing about the sort of border politics that's been happening in the United States? Generally, the answer was nothing or not much, but there was one group of Jamaican migrants who told me that they had seen some rumors on TikTok of what they described as an impending border shutdown. In some cases, this had actually motivated some of them to try and risk making the crossing sooner than they had, than they had planned because they wanted to sort of get in before the border shut down. Now, it's possible, Hallie, we can't know for sure, but it's possible that what they they saw on TikTok was, again, some kind of garbled version of what was discussed in this now defunct Senate bill. You and I both know that border shutdown never happened. It probably was never going to happen. And nevertheless, it had consequences on the way that migrants here were making decisions. I can't say what will happen with this Mallorca's vote, uh, if anything, in terms of uh, in what way it trickles down to here, but it could have some consequences. Look, I also sp I spoke to some uh, volunteers here today who've been gathering here to give food and water to the migrants that are stuck out here you know, in, in the elements. Mm -hmm. um, and I asked one of them if he thinks people in D.C. 
understand the reality here on the border. Here's what he had to say. Their um, vision for how immigration should be treated, for how asylum should be treated, for how border communities should be treated are not based on reality. And they're based on uh, a false notion of pushing their politics front and center without really considering the humanitarian impact that that has. Hallie, even if what's happening in D.C. on the border is only so much political theater, it can still have consequences. The key point is that they aren't necessarily the consequences that we can expect or predict. Hallie? David Noriega, we're glad to have you there along the border for us tonight. Appreciate you being there. Court documents just into us in the last hour are giving us some new details on what may have led a woman to open fire inside a Houston megachurch this weekend. We're talking about court docs from 2022 saying that the shooter intentionally hurt her son at least two times before. Remember, this is the little boy, seven years old, who was hurt in this megachurch shooting. He is now apparently fighting for his life, according to officials. In 2021, these documents say that the shooter's ex-husband told the court that she would physically attack him and on multiple occasions chased him out of the house with knives. The boy's grandmother, the ex-mother-in-law of the shooter, talking to Houston station KHOW in an interview, saying that her family tried to get her help. Watch. There were red flags for six years, and we raised them, and we flew them high, and nothing was done. All of it potentially having something to do with these scary scenes when the shooter sent people running for their lives. Morgan Chesky is live for us in Houston. And Morgan, I know that we have some um, essentially, I don't want to say pushback, but some new information coming to us from Conroe police here in just the last hour as we look at these court documents here that seem to be flashing warning signs that had been building for years. Yeah, and that's acknowledged, Hallie, by multiple parties involved here, family members of Moreno, in addition to authorities that say that there were multiple incidents that they were aware of regarding a mental health issues. I want to share with you one particular statement shared by a, a woman named Wally Carranza. She's identified herself, of course, as uh, the mother-in-law, former mother-in-law of the shooter here. And when it comes to prior issues. This is what she had to say. The fault lies in a child protective services of Montgomery County, where Conroe is located, and Harris County, where Houston is located, that refused to remove custody from a woman with m known mental illness that was not being treated and with the state of Texas for not having strong red flag laws. That is certainly how that family is feeling right now, especially with that seven-year-old still in critical condition. And the concept of red flag law is important to note here, Hallie, because even when they are in place, it can be incredibly tough for anyone, particularly family members, to prove that this person is a risk to themselves or to others. I want you to hear what a former ATF agent had to say about this very issue. Take a listen. Even if you have gone and sought mental health treatment on your own, or you've been taken into police custody for 24 hours or 48 hours, that is not going to prevent people from possessing firearms in virtually every state in the country. Now, I, I posed the question because of what we had heard from so many neighbors there, Hallie, saying that Moreno created this toxic, chaotic environment, what people should have done. Yeah. And he said, okay, let's say they call police and they show up even if they encounter Moreno uh, acting in a manner that seems uh, unfit to own a firearm, police cannot unilaterally take away that right from her. There still has to be due process here. Uh, unfortunately, as we see now, time and time again, uh, despite those red flags coming up, that whole process was not seen through, and we are now seeing the results of that. Hallie? Morgan, it may be too early to, to know about this yet, but I'm curious. Obviously, this all happened at the church you're standing in front of here, Lakewood, led by celebrity pastor Joel Osteen. Are they planning to hold services on Sunday? Obviously, he has reacted on and talked about what happened this past Sunday. What do we know about the days to come for this community? Yeah, very good question. We do know that we have not had access to the church since this took place. There has not been any official announcement on when services okay. will return. But keep in mind that uh, Sunday, not the only day this church has services, their sanctuary alone can house 16,000 people. And over the course of one week, 
They're known to have 45,000 churchgoers mm. pass in and out of their doors. Uh, fortunately, in this instance, uh, everyone crediting those two off-duty officers working as security uh, for acting as quickly as they did uh, and returning fire uh, and neutralizing this threat before uh, anyone else could get hurt. I, I, I don't know if you mentioned it or not, Hallie, but that other churchgoer who was shot in the leg was released from the hospital yeah. uh, and is back home tonight. Yeah, that 57-year-old man recovering back at home. Morgan Chesky, we're glad to have you there with so many new developments tonight on this story. Appreciate it. Coming up, a lot more to get to here on the show, including a terrifying scene in Turkey, how rescuers are trying to get to at least nine workers trapped underground. Plus, the mystery around one pregnancy, a stingray pregnancy in North Carolina. So as President Biden makes a push to get the House to approve the Senate's foreign aid package, he is also slamming his top Republican rival in a potential general election, Donald Trump, for saying the Russians can do whatever the hell they want to allies that don't pay enough for NATO. The president says comments like that put the whole world at risk. Trump gave an invitation to Putin to invade some of our allies, NATO allies. For God's sake, it's dumb, it's shameful, it's dangerous, it's un-American. Mr. Trump, already responding tonight, saying NATO nations have to pay their fair share in defense spending. And if they don't, in his words, America first. Kelly O'Donnell is joining us, joining us now. And Kelly, this was a sharp attack from President Biden in this um, very presidential setting, if you will, to go after Donald Trump on this issue, on a foreign policy issue here. It's coming at a time when the president is also making this speech, right, making these remarks to try to make the case for Congress to pass this big foreign aid package we talked about a few minutes ago in the show. Is there any hope in the White House for that? Because based on what we hear from the Hill, particularly on the House side, uh, there doesn't seem to be reason for optimism. Give us a view from where you're standing. Well, that's a very frank assessment uh, from our colleagues who are covering that very closely. And at the same time, from uh, the, the White House perspective, this is where the president has to use the power of his office. And in some ways, it might be, to some viewers, talking about his campaign season adversary. In other ways, mm. it's very much about governing, but it's really also about the United States' place in the world. So depending on the lens in which you look at his remarks today, you can see different things. President mm. Biden really took that sort of presidential mantle and talked about U.S. credibility, partnerships and alliances that go back decades, needing to stand up and defend another nation if they are in the NATO alliance and if Russia were to act. Those are things that he argues cannot be uh, the sort of a winds blowing of campaign time much bigger and effectively more important than the rhetoric of campaign season. Donald Trump coming back and saying nations have to pay their fair share. Well, that's really not in dispute. There is a code for uh, a formula for how yeah. those nations that are a part of it do pay. Some pay more than the required. Some are uh, behind. That is something where President Biden says this isn't about a transaction where you shake down a country to get them to do what you want. It's about a much deeper alliance. So very uh, difficult uh, issues to put into the everyday conversation, but very important issues. So, yes, there's a measure that needs to pass according to the White House view of national security. And House Republicans uh, say they want to take another pass at it at a different time and split it all up. So for President Biden, today was a chance to talk about governing, about American alliances, and in the process, took quite a swipe at his adversary. Hallie? Kelly O'Donnell, live for us there in Washington, outside the White House. Kel, thanks. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, Boeing deliveries are down after a series of plane problems. Of course, like when it's plane, flown by Alaska Airlines, had a door plug blow out in mid-flight. The company says it sent out just 27 planes last month, Boeing's lowest number since September. Boeing says it'll get its act together and work on quality and safety. Number two, today thousands of flight attendants in three different unions are picketing and rallying at 30 airports. There they are in Chicago. They want things like new contracts and more money. Pilots got pay raises last year, while some flight attendants say they haven't gotten raises in years. Number three, Katy Perry says she is leaving American Idol after this season, her seventh season. She says she loves the show, but feels ready to see the world and tease the potential she could make some new music. Is she the one that got away? Maybe, but she says she could come back one day if they'll have her. 
Number four, shipwreck hunters announced they found this ship that sank in Lake Superior during a storm back in 1940. The crew got out safely, but the captain apparently went down with the ship. Thing is, we don't know why he didn't escape. It's still a mystery. The researcher behind the discovery says he hopes it can give some closure to the captain's family. Number five, a female stingray at a North Carolina aquarium, a stingray named Charlotte, is pregnant. Thing is, there are no male stingrays in the tank. Two theories for how this could have happened. There's a rare process where eggs can develop on their own without fertilization. So that's option one. Option two, it is possible that Charlotte could have mated with a male shark that was in the tank. We're gonna find out more when a DNA test is done after the pups are born. When we come back, the new video of one pilot held captive for a year in Indonesia. Plus, why police in India are trying to block farmers from getting to New Delhi. NBC News covers hundreds of international stories every day, and because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our teams around the world have done it for you. Here are some of what they're watching in a segment we call The Global. Out of Turkey, look at this, very scary video. Oof, that huge landslide near a gold mine. Officials say they think at least nine workers are trapped underground. Look at that, it's just like a wave. That's not water, that's just dirt, earth swallowing everything in its path. Turkish officials say hundreds of search and rescue personnel are out at that site looking for survivors. Out of Indonesia group, a rebel group in the West Papua region say they're gonna release a pilot from New Zealand they've held captive for a year. The group kidnapped him after he landed a small commercial plane in a remote spot. They released videos of him where he says he's being treated well. It's not clear when the videos were taken or when he's actually gonna get released if it happens. And out of India, clashes erupting, some fighting here between police and hundreds of farmers marching to New Delhi. The farmers want the government to honor a years old promise to pay them more for crops. The police responded by firing tear gas and tightening security on the border between two states. Also overseas tonight, we are just learning that an American citizen has been killed in the occupied West Bank with the State Department confirming that in just the last couple of hours. The U.S. says it's working with Israel to try to find out more information about how this happened. Mohammed Kador's father tells NBC News his son was shot in the head by Israeli forces when he was heading back home from a picnic with some of his friends and family, making the 17-year-old the second American teenager killed in the West Bank in a month. Let's bring in Raf Sanchez, live for us in Tel Aviv. What else do we know about this particular situation? So, Hali, Mohamed Hadour, as you said, 17 years old, he was attending high school in the occupied West Bank, just outside of Jerusalem, but his family, based in Miami, Florida, and they say on Saturday, about 4.30 p.m. local time, he was out with friends having a picnic near Jerusalem. They say Israeli forces opened fire on the car that he was traveling in. He was hit in the head by one of those rounds. Now, we asked the Israeli military earlier about this shooting, kind of unusually, Hallie, they referred us to the Shin Bet, Israel's domestic security agency. We haven't yet had an answer from them about what happened here. But as you mentioned, this is the second young Palestinian American killed in the West Bank in the last month or so. The other 17 year old, Tafiq Abdul Jabbar, who was born and raised in Louisiana. No one has been arrested in his killing. And Hallie, human rights groups will tell you that there is a long history history of Palestinians, be they Americans or not, being killed in the West Bank with very little follow-up, very little investigation, and very little accountability into their deaths. Allie. Can you give us a picture, too, more broadly in the region here? Because we're also just learning that South Africa is putting in this urgent request to the UN's top court to try to get them to intervene in some of the deadly attacks that Israel is launching in Rafah, the southernmost city in the Gaza Strip. Walk us through that. Yeah, Hallie, so viewers will remember, South Africa went to the International Court of Justice. They accused Israel of committing genocide in Gaza, an accusation Israel denies. But the court issued what they call provisional measures, basically saying Israel needs to take all precautions to make sure that its forces are not committing genocide in Gaza. And today, the South Africans went back to the court and they said, look, if Israel does launch this attack on Rafah, where half the population of Gaza, some 1.4 
million people are sheltering, it would be a violation of the court's order. Now, Holly, as we've talked about before, the court has very limited ability to actually enforce its rulings. So it's not clear the judges who sit on this court are actually going to be able to do anything about this looming Israeli offensive in Rafah. But we did hear from the president yesterday, speaking alongside the king of Jordan, saying the U.S. does not support an Israeli offensive into Rafah unless there is a credible plan to get those civilians to safety. The U.N. and other humanitarian groups are saying there is simply nowhere for these people to run. Hallie. Raf Sanchez live for us there in Tel Aviv tonight. Raf, thank you. Coming up, Nikki Haley calling out former President Trump's push to try to reshape who runs the GOP as we're learning more from the former president's son-in-law about whether he'd take a job in a potential second term. That's next. Donald Trump tonight taking another step to try to remake the Republican Party in his image, rolling out the three people he wants to take over the party's organizing and fundraising apparatus. They are one of the big-time backers of his lies about his 2020 election loss, a close campaign advisor, and his daughter-in-law, Laura Trump. His only remaining opponent, his only remaining serious opponent in this race, Nikki Haley, in the primary, is clapping back from her hometown in South Carolina. Think about what's happening right now. Is that how you're going to try and take an election? That's all his polling shows. She is trailing Mr. Trump in her home state of South Carolina. Look at that, 65% to 30%, which is just about two weeks, not even, to the primary. Garrett Hake is live for us on the Hill. Interesting game plan here by Nikki Haley, right? Increasingly personal in her attacks as Donald Trump is trying to take another step to bring together the GOP in his name, if you will, with his loyalists. Yeah, I think that's right, Hallie. I mean, here you see Donald Trump trying to look past Nikki Haley, taking steps that you do normally see a nominee take, but typically when they're the nominee, or at least when they're the presumptive nominee after a primary is over, by trying to force this consolidation of the institutional Republican Party behind him even now. He chokes off her options even further. Nikki Haley running a much more aggressive campaign now in South Carolina than she really did at any point during this contest up until now. You could argue it's too late. But the problem here is also that we have seen through ample polling that going after Donald Trump directly can also make you less popular with the kind of base Republican voters who are deciding things in states like Iowa and states like New Han or excuse me, South Carolina that she has to win now. So tricky politics for her as Donald Trump is trying to basically say, I'm over this part of the race. I'm already looking ahead to Joe Biden. So, it, and like, let's say he's looking ahead to a potential second term, too. There, there is somebody, a, a loyalist, if you will, who sounds like he won't be a part of his administration. Jared Kushner, his son-in-law, obviously a former senior advisor in the first term, was asked about this in a brand new interview with Axios in just the last hour. Let me play a little bit of that exchange. So is that a no? If he calls you on November whatever and says, I'd like to come back to DC, you say, thanks, but I'm good? Uh, yes. Uh, you know, from, from my perspective, uh, again, if you look at the way President Trump has been handling his campaign this time, uh, this is his third time doing it. And he's had time um, to uh, to really reflect on everything. I think that the team around him is, is maybe the best he's had. What's so interesting here, right, is the Jared Kushner of it all, somebody who was um, very much engaged in the White House operations in, in some ways and disengaged in others based on all the reporting over the mm -hmm. course of the last, you know, many years. A That's right. Kind of a lightning rod, you know, uh, for some of those in the former president's inner circle. People loved him or they sure did not love him. Now he's kind of saying, well, I'm doing all these investment, like I'm, I've got this investing thing going on, like I'm good. And talking about the way that he sees his father-in-law's political operation running in the future. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple pieces to that, Hallie. Uh, number one, most Republicans I talk to agree with the sentiment that this Trump campaign is the most well-run of his three presidential campaigns. They like the team around him. They like the way that that team has been able to balance the competing uh, issues here of letting Trump be Trump and also running a campaign that could at least theoretically win in a general election and not alienate the people in the middle to win over the people on the right that uh, Trump appeals to kind of more naturally. The idea of Kushner not being involved in a second Trump campaign uh, White House is interesting because given his role as the president's son-in-law, the stuff he says to the president, if he were to be president again, would still carry enormous weight whether he has a formal role or not, right? What he says at brunch on a Sunday morning is just as important to Donald Trump as what his paid advisors might mm. say. And I think you heard Kushner kind of expand on this idea of why he wouldn't come back but could potentially still be influential in some more remarks from that same interview.
There's been a lot more time for people to think about the policies. I think he has a much better understanding of who was effective in all these different roles. Uh, and I suspect he'll have a, a very, very long list of very qualified people uh, to choose from from all the different uh, jobs. So you see, because you're talking about the team that is potentially available to Donald Trump, I, mark my words, uh, Hallie, if Donald Trump does win the presidency, Kushner doesn't need a formal role to still be influential in that White House. Garrett Hake, live for us there on the Hill. Uh, Garrett, thank you. Lots to talk about, I know, uh, as it relates to the campaign tonight. I appreciate it. So listen, as Nikki Haley fights to stay in this race to try to make her case against former President Trump, she's going after him as a tax raiser, in her words, and soft on Russia in a new commercial boosting her ad buys to $6 million in her home state of South Carolina and announcing plans for her campaign in Super Tuesday states today. By all accounts, right, all indications that she, at least right now, is planning to stay in this race. Over the last few months, our NBC News campaign embed, Sarah Dean, has been talking with Haley voters on the campaign trail to see what's driving their vote. Watch. Nikki Haley has the vitality that I don't see with Biden, and she has the honesty and integrity I don't see with Trump. I like the fact that she's willing to fall out the Republicans and the Democrats. I just trust her. Nikki Haley, now the last woman standing, with all other challengers to former President Donald Trump out of the GOP primary race. I want some young blood in there, and I'd love to see a lady president before I die. Over months, we've spoken with dozens of Haley supporters. What draws them to the former U.N. ambassador and South Carolina governor? For many, it's her experience. With her experience the United Nations, I think she brings a lot to the table. And supporters think if she's going to gain any momentum against the frontrunner, she has to do it in her home state. The best chance she has is here. 48-year-old Rich Tassin of Charleston, South Carolina, says he voted Democrat in the last election and has never voted in a GOP primary before. But he plans to cast his ballot for Haley at the end of the month. Haley's the only hope if we have any respect for the actual GOP, for the Republican Party. I, I really I really believe that. Haley says the Republican Party needs to appeal to independent-minded voters like Rich in order to win in a general election, an argument many of her supporters echo. I think she appeals to moderates and independents, and I think Trump will alienate those voters. Haley's going after people like 64-year-old retired mechanic Jackie Weidman, he hasn't voted in years and has never attended a political rally. So this is all new music to me. But in Maudlin, South Carolina, he stood on stage alongside Haley with a sign. I haven't seen nobody in 15 or almost 20 years that was worthy of my vote. And I hope to, uh, and pray that the people of the United States will start looking uh, in another direction instead of toward these colossal fossils, as I call them. Elizabeth Cole of Charleston, South Carolina, has a similar story. This is actually the first political event I've ever been to, first t-shirt I've ever worn, because I just really believe in what Nikki represents. If there's one thing most Haley supporters I spoke with agree on, they don't like Trump, even if they voted for him twice. It's too much luggage. <laughs> I don't want the drama, and Donald had his chance. I voted for him, now I want to move on to someone else. The chaos, it, was, it just got to be to the point where it was so detrimental that it wasn't worth it, and I say Trump supporter having to defend some of the stupid things he said. I could not him. Sarah Dean, NBC News. Our thanks to Sarah for that report. Some other breaking news we're getting in literally the last five minutes or so. The defense secretary, Lloyd Austin, is now out of the hospital. The Pentagon says he has now fully resumed his duties. Remember, we told you about this last night on the show. Austin had to go to Walter Reed Medical Center for a bladder issue that forced him to cancel a trip to Europe. He'd been treated for prostate cancer back in December. That created some fallout because the president didn't know that there were complications from a surgery he later had. We're going to have more details for you from this Pentagon briefing and the Pentagon information as we get it. Still to come, why Paramount, which owns CBS, is laying off hundreds of people even after getting record Super Bowl ratings. One of the world's oldest media companies at a crossroads tonight with Paramount announcing it's going to fire 800 people. That's something like 3% of the company. The timing's super interesting here. Paramount owns CBS, which, as you probably heard, just had the Super Bowl, and that did a huge number, more than 123 million viewers across all of Paramount's platforms. Eight million more people watched this year than last year. 
and it had more viewers than any other TV program ever, except for the moon landing back in 1969. How about that? Moon landing, Taylor Bowl, top two. As an added bonus, Paramount raked in an additional 35 million bucks. Why? Because of those overtime ads. More football means more money, but apparently not enough to stop the bleeding at Paramount. Chloe Malas is joining us now. They got a lot of buzz with some of these innovative ideas like that Nickelodeon broadcast of the Super Bowl when like SpongeBob was at the anchor desk going after my job and your job. But as we're seeing here, big numbers do not always mean big profits. Well, first of all, my kids loved that, and that was a fun way to introduce them to the Super Bowl. They're four years old and six years old, so kudos to Paramount for that <laughs> uh, creative thinking. But here's the deal. So although so many people watch the Super Bowl, this is just a fluke thing because mm. next year, CBS, they're not going to have the Super Bowl. Another network is, and that's the way it works every single year. Yes, they saw 120 million people watching the Super Bowl just on CBS, not to mention all the other sisters networks that they own like nick logo paramount univision logo that also streamed and aired the super bowl now bob backish the ceo of paramount global came out and said this these adjustments will help enable us to build on our momentum and execute our strategic vision for the year ahead and i firmly believe that we have much to be excited about now we knew in the media that these layoffs were coming as of a couple months ago so the two are not mutually exclusive you can and have record ratings for the Super Bowl on CBS while also making the company leaner. Right. And the big question is why Paramount has seen big losses, $238 million in losses from their Paramount Plus subscription streaming program, uh, streaming service. And also, even though they have more subscribers to that platform, they're still seeing huge losses, Hallie. Th that said, the Super Bowl numbers are a way to kind of make the pro put the product on a, on a pedestal, if you will. You're seeing Paramount do things like bring Jon Stewart back to The Daily Show. He just debuted last night. Is the thinking that that kind of thing make them more, would make them more appealing in a sale? So that's the big question. Sherry Redstone, the daughter of Sumner Redstone, she owns 10% of CBS Paramount. Is she going to merge with perhaps a Warner Brothers Discovery? Now, Axios broke that story, Sarah Fisher, um, and we know that, uh, you know, also CNBC has reported that there are talks happening between Paramount to potentially merge. And what would happen and why are they making this workforce leaner? Now, I spoke to media analysts and authors author of hoax Brian Stelter just moments ago. I know he was on your program last yeah. week and he says, it's one thing to make it leaner, Hallie. It's another thing to look malnourished. And that at the end of the day, they have to execute. They are a news organization. They have a million different platforms. Like, let's talk about some of them. Paramount Pictures logo, CBS logo, CBS News logo, Showtime logo, Pluto TV logo. So you don't want to get too lean where you can't get the job done. And then maybe you're not as appealing for someone to acquire you. It's that fine line they got to be walking here. Chloe Malas, thank you so much for all of your reporting tonight. As always, appreciate it. That does it for us for this hour. We've got more coverage picking up right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.